dorime interino ad appare dorime ameno ameno latire latire So, um, I will be presenting the position of the Monarchians. Um, so, who were the Monarchians? Uh, this will be a short presentation, and I will not be able to do it full justice, but with uh, the essentials that we'll be providing, it will give a, uh, the essentials of the belief system and the historical background of the Monarchians. So I'll be quoting from History of Dogma, Volume 3, by Adolf Harnack, who was a Trinitarian, by the way, an objective historian. He says the really dangerous opponent of the Logos Christology in the period between 180 and 300 was not adoptionism. This is your typical Unitarians, um, Sonetians, Arians, uh, all those that deny the deity of Jesus Christ. So Matt didn't really specify uh, when he said that uh, denying the Trinity, well, it's specifically denying the deity of God, uh, of Jesus. But the doctrine which saw the deity himself incarnate in Christ and conceived Christ to be God in a human body, the Father become flesh. Against this view, the great doctors of the church, Tertullian, Origen, Novation, but above all, Hypolitus had principally to fight. Its defenders were called by Tertullian, Monarchiani, and not altogether correctly, Patripassiani, which afterwards became the usual names in the West. The doctrine of the Trine God encounters heavy resistance from the majority of the faithful during that time. Tertullian and Hippolytus did not to all appearance yet succeed in getting the form of doctrine approved in the churches. The God of mystery of whom they taught was viewed as an unknown God. Fun fact, check Acts 17 verse 23. And the Christology did not correspond to the wants of men. The Logos was indeed to be held one in essence with God, but yet he was by his being made the organ of the creation of the world, an inferior divine being, or rather at once inferior and not inferior. This conception, however, conflicted with tradition as embodied in worship, which taught men to see God himself, keyword himself in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.19, Colossians 2.9, Philippians 2.6.7 are just some of these scriptural references you can check. Quite as much as the attempt was opposed by doctrinal tradition to derive the use of the name Son of God for Christ, not from his miraculous birth, but from a decree dating before the world. This is the eternal Son uh, doctrine. Wherever the doctrine of the Logos planted itself in the third century, the question whether the divine being who appeared on earth was identical with the deity was answered in the negative. In opposition of this Gnostic view, which was first to be corrected in the fourth century, the Monarchians maintained a very ancient and valuable position in clinging to the identity of the eternal deity with the deity revealed on earth. And lastly, this is a quick um, a summary from Thomas Tomkinson from the Muggletonian's Principles Prevailing, a 17th century historian, a Monarchian. He says, Sibelius, the bishop, being about 200 years after Christ and Noatius was contemporary with him, there was truth then in the world and a trinity of persons in one Godhead had not got a footing at that time. But after religion was set up by imperial power, then bishops were chosen out of learned and philosophical men and churches, as they called them, building and riches given for their support. Then were synods and councils called to establish error and formal worship and to suppress truth. Thus was Noatius and Sibelius doctrine judged heresy both by Trinitarians and Arians. So this is the brief summary of the Monarchian position. Well, anyway, so, you know, one thing that that uh, animates a lot of, of Unitarians is they they only get this kind of egalitarian picture of the Trinity and uh, something that you know, I think in popular kind of evangelical circles, a lot of times the view of the Trinity is 
either it is just a thinly veiled modalism or it's something that's kind of tantamount to modalism. And that's what they get. And that's what they really think is like the doctrine of the Trinity. And then they go to the Bible and it's like, well, here, God's just the father, like all through the New Testament, you know, it looks like the word God just kind of refers to the father. And that throws them for a loop. And then they just decide to kind of abandon the doctrine of the Trinity altogether. And uh, I'll just say Jesus is a human and, you know, we'll just kind of move on. Um, and so I think that's one of the, the big problems is that you you really, uh, if you if you take this more egalitarian approach, you're going to be thrown for a loop when you when you go to the scriptures. And that's one of the things that Augustine, uh, it's kind of a move that he made that I think was a mistake is is in order to respond to these Arian objections about, you know, Jesus calling the Father the only true God, he says, well, that's really the Trinity. Like whenever we hear the, you know, God in the Bible, it's just the Trinity as a whole. And I think that kind of gave him a certain response. It, it helped him with some certain arguments, but I think it's it's ultimately kind of a mistake. Um, and so um, one, one of the things also uh, that it helps us do is kind of understand monotheism. So if you think about it in the very earliest centuries of Christianity, um, people didn't really talk about, they, they didn't use the word monotheism. They just used the word monarchia. If you think about it in the very earliest centuries of Christianity, um, people didn't really talk about, they, they didn't use the word monotheism. They just used the word monarchia. So if you read like Tertullian and old, you know, apologetics against the modalists, um, they don't say, oh, they're really concerned about monotheism. They say they're really concerned about the monarchia. So if you read like Tertullian and old, you know, apologetics against the modalists, um, they don't say, oh, they're really concerned about monotheism. They say they're really concerned about the monarchia. And they this is they the want to on the monarchians. OK, attempts to maintain on monarchian lines are like the oneness you see, this is where we get our word, the oneness and soul rule of God.
um, they don't say, oh, they're really concerned about monotheism. They say they're really concerned about the monarchia and they, they want to collapse all the persons to preserve the monarchia. So there's this kind of equation, even, even in, up into the fourth century, when people would say to St. Basil, they'd say, hey, you're a tritheist because you've got these three distinct persons and they've all got the divine nature. He, he didn't say like, well, you know, they're all kind of one, but they're kind of three and it's real complicated. And, you know, they're all sort of God as a whole, whatever. What he responded, uh, the way he responded was he said, there's one God because there's one father. Uh, and so, again, it was the sword because there's one sort of ultimate first principle. That's the sense in which there's only one God. Uh, and one, um, actually, one of the- I couldn't confidently pick a first person, but it's definitely around in the 100s, at least the second half of the 100s. And so remember following Justin Martyr, the Logos theologian says there are two gods and two two lords. You know, there's basically the one true God and there's also this lesser God who's less transcendent. Right? God can't be located or be incarnated, but hey, this Logos can do those things. Because it's sort of in between the one God, one God and creation. Um, in my own view, what happened was the God talk got a lot looser in the 100s. So in the New Testament, the influence is, is mostly Jewish, and they're very stingy about referring to anybody else as a God. Uh, things are quite different by the time you get to the year 180, especially with mostly Gentile people in mainstream Christianity. So in the writings of the 100s and onward, they gleefully refer to Jesus as God and our God, um, generally not the one true God, but I think that ordinary people, when they hear Jesus being called God and think there's only one God, and they're also aware that sometimes the gods could appear among us, right? The pagans had incarnation type ideas, avatars and so on. I think it wasn't that unusual for ordinary people to say, Hey, Jesus is God in the flesh. This is just God in human form or God visiting us physically somehow. Um, there are apocryphal books in the New Testament, you know, books that never really had a chance to make it into the canon from the late 100s and 200s, sometimes which just seem to confuse Jesus with God. And we know that the modalistic monarchians, such as the Praxius denounced by Tertullian, um, we know that they were reacting against Logos theory by saying, no, don't tell me there's a greater God and a lesser God. There's only one God, only one creator. We uphold the monarchy of the Father. And what you're calling the second God, the Logos, really is just the same God as the first God. It's just a manifestation of God or something, or a power of God or an action of God. So we know those people were around end of the 100s, early 200s. We know it because of the theological arguments, the Logos theorists, uh, denouncing them, but we also know it because a few random books just seem to confuse Jesus and God, you know, not unlike your average evangelical in the pew today, because with all the, you know, all the sound and fury about Trinity theories and the two natures and so on, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of ordinary Christians just think Jesus is just God himself, and or they think that on certain days of the week, and then they read the New Testament and think, Jesus is someone and God is someone else. It's just it's just confusion. Um, so I think it's probably almost always been around. Yeah, so it sounds like it definitely predated uh, what became a Trinitarianism. One. Yeah, yeah we, and again, we know because uh, Novation, Tertullian, Origen, we know that people push back against their Logos theory and that some of them were collapsing the Father and Son or the Logos and God more like together into one. Uh, oh, do we hold to that? Do we believe that? Wouldn't that, if we if we talk about the monarchy of the Father, uh, doesn't that lower the status of the Son? What, what is the monarchy of the Father? Then? So, monarchia is the monarchians. Just quick introduction: the monarchians were the original Christians, and I'm going to be sharing many quotes tonight that lead up to what we call the Nicene Creed. You have to understand who were the Christians before the Arian controversy arose. Now, what is the Arian controversy? 
the Aryan controversy is essentially Gnostics, pagan Christians that started to infiltrate the church and they started to devalue the deity of Jesus Christ. They started to strip the deity from our risen Lord and say, no, no, he's a demiurge. He's a lesser God. He is even just a man. You had different branches in the Aryans. You had the dynamic ones. You had the uh, the Sonetians that came later. Um, but Aryans were literally the party that considered Jesus created in heaven. So literally God the Father prece preceded a second entity and that entity was called the eternal son and they both shared authority they both shared glory which completely violates passages like isaiah 48 11 which says i will not yield my glory and that glory is associated with rulership it's associated with power it's associated with identity god is saying i'm not going to yield that I'm not going to give it away. And the word in Hebrew is abandon. So God would literally saying in that verse, I am the creator. I am the ruler. I'm not going to abandon all of my accomplishments and give it to someone else. So the language is very strong. And um, essentially, this is what the Aryans were circulating in Rome during that time when uh, Callistus Zephyrinus were monarchian bishops, modalistic monarchians, and they believe that God, the word mode is a, is a word coined by Adolf Harnack. He was a Trinitarian historian. Uh, mode essentially is the way God operates in different offices. So God can operate as a priest. He can operate as a king. He can operate as a savior. And we know there are many scriptures, Brother Paul, that you're familiar with in Isaiah, in the prophets, where it says literally God himself will save his people in the last days. Before that, God would send prophets. He would send, he would send uh, sorry, judges like Samson. He would send people um, like David, like Saul, as anointed saviors. But after these um these men were found uh, uh weak they were they were not perfect they would sin they would fall short of the office that they were given by god and this is why we see god says my own arm has brought salvation to me so the just to summarize the the trinity doctrine was developed due to this controversy that arose with the original Christians whom were called at the time monarchians. And it comes from the Greek word monarchia, which basically means the ruler, one ruler, the ruling of one, the principle of the ruling of one being, one person, not three distinct persons sharing glory, only one creator, one person. So this is what we're going to be talking about tonight. And you will see the inconsistencies in the creed because you will see that the, the modalists were not yet um, expulsed from the Roman Catholic Church. Um, uh, during the Nicene Creed in 325 AD, the people that coined the term homusias, which means uh, same being, it's a compound word of homo, and usias, which is substance, being, if you will, um, they coined this term, same being. So what they essentially they were trying to show during that council is the sun is not a distinct being. He's not a distinct individual. He's not a distinct person. He is the, literally the same person whom we call the Father, whom we call the Holy Spirit. It's just different modes of operation it's different ways that god uh, introduces himself he presents himself in various ways he has different 
functions, okay? Like I said, king, redeemer, priest, shepherd, father, son. These are all titles and functions that belong to God. Now, God sends angels, but angels do not have the same prerogatives in regards to salvation and in regards to worship. This is exclusively uh, God's doing. And this is why we have a very harsh rebukes in the scriptures about worshiping angels or fearing the, the heavenly hosts. And uh, this causes, ido causes idolatry. So that's me sharing this, brother, because it's really a, a meaty topic. It's packed with a lot of sub uh, categories, but <clears throat> we have to understand how the 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 Aryan controversy arose it arose because when the, the monarchians they saw the threat in advance and they warned the church leaders to um, fight um, theologically spiritually this threat